Midnight on Earth podcast with your host, Jake Weaver. Engineered by Cedric Swan. Hey, everybody. We're back with another episode of Midnight on Earth. I'm your host, Jake Weaver. And as usual, we are here to bring you more knowledge, more lights, and more love. Well, we have incredible guests today. We have Jacob Wyatt, the Director of Communications for the Foundation for the Law of Time. We're going to talk about some really interesting stuff. It's going to be an incredible episode. I'm really glad you're here with us. But first, before we do that, I need you to do something for me. Follow me on Instagram at midnight underscore on underscore earth. That's the address. If you haven't followed me yet, please follow me there. Spotify, Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, wherever you go to get your podcasts, just click the button that connects us. So you get those notifications, you know, when something's going on with us, you get the little message pop up on your device and it's a cool thing. And of course, Tell a friend, word of mouth is so huge. If you know people that are into these types of conversations that want to talk about the law of time, all these really enlightening topics, send them here. This is an incredible place for us to connect. Midnightonearth.com. So, all right, now that that's out of the way, I want to introduce you to Jacob Wyatt. I'm so glad he's here with us today. And here's his bio. Jacob Wyatt is Director of Communications for the Foundation for the Law of Time. He is a teacher of the 13 moons and all facets of the law of time, having shared his knowledge over the last 17 years with thousands of people around the world. Having studied directly with the founder of the Foundation for the Law of Time, Jose Arguez, Jacob has also served as his trusted personal assistant since 2003, and now works directly with Stephanie South. Jacob is the chief creator of the annual Star Traveler's 13 Moon Almanac of Synchronicity, and he's created countless graphics for the Law of Time publications, written more than 60 essays via his 13 Moon course, which you can find at lawoftime.org and also NewTimeCourse.com. Jacob, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jake. How are you? (laughs) Incredible name, Jacob Wyatt. We have the same (laughs) initials. My birth name is Jacob. I have to say incredible name. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, and I really appreciate that you invited me. I look forward to diving in. Well, you know, we have these topics that we like to address, these topics that are mystical in a way, spiritual They're helping people evolve. They're helping people grow. It could be new information. It could be something maybe you heard years ago and didn't really have a lot of time to investigate, but this is what we're here to do. We're here to share this information. So super glad you're here. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your foundation. So the foundation was started by Jose Arguez, who a lot of people know because he was one of the biggest voices, I think, early on for the whole 2012 concept and also just some of the mystical and spiritual aspects of the Mayan culture, right? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, he, in his book, uh, the Mayan factor from 1987, that was where, you know, 2012 kind of first hit the public consciousness. And, you know, at that point, uh, it was also kind of synchronized with, uh, with an event that, that he and his wife at the time were working on called the Harmonic Convergence, right. uh, which which became the world's first globally synchronized meditation for peace. Um, and it was also in fulfillment of like this uh, super synchronized uh, prophecy cycle um, relating to Quetzalcoatl that concluded on uh, August 16th and 17th, 1987. And, you know, for me, I was like, I was five at this time, but so many people around the world participated in that millions of people gathered at different like sacred sites or just wherever they were. And we've also been contacted by tons of people who say like, you know, I didn't even know this was going on, but I I remember that day, like I felt like I needed to go 
in nature or, you know, go connect or go, go deep in meditation or something. So people are kind of intuitively getting tuned into what was going on. And people also kind of intentionally all tuned in together and kind of the, you know, the say, say prophecy aspect behind the harmonic convergence was that like if 144,000, you know, so-called sun dancers arose uh, with the, or with the rising sun, you know, in surrender to the earth, uh, then we would avert catastrophe. <laughs> and that so, was a Hopi we, prophecy, right? If I remember correctly, the the well, the hundred forty four thousand um, sun dancers that was that was based on the work of a guy named Tony Shearer in his studies of like the Mayan culture. Oh, Mayan system. culture. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then the um, like the prophecy cycle of Quetzalcoatl. But the yeah, the Hopi do have the the whirling rainbow nation as part of their. Um, mythology i guess or spiritual understanding so he was the one that organized the group meditation for peace in 1987 based on the harmonic convergence and yeah and in the midst of that he also brought to the general consciousness via his book the mayan factor this whole concept of what was going on with the mayans and how they perceived time because it was probably known but it wasn't really thrust to the mainstream as much before then and then look how that exploded between 1987 and 2012 and it's still kind of a part of our culture but uh as conscious you know spiritual people but it was there was that huge push between the actual time of 1987 and 2012 which was really amazing he was a huge part of that yeah yeah he was i mean if you think in 1987 you know there wasn't social media or even the internet so this word was spread by phone calls and fax machines, you know, word of mouth. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty remarkable to consider the the global reach that it got, you know, cause I mean, they just, they just don't, we don't have that, those kind of tool. They didn't have those kind of tools, you know, it was just, it just, uh, it was the right time, you know? So something and, powerful happened at that time. It attracted people, it brought people together and it was yeah. right around that time as well, where he came up with this 13 moon concept. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, ever since uh, he was, ever since he was a kid, really, he had uh, been fascinated by like the Mayan uh, calendric system and the mathematics and, and Mayan culture um, being that, you know, his, his father was Mexican and his um, mother, I believe was, a, was a German woman. So like he, you know, he was raised uh, multicultural born, uh, born in the United States, though, <laughs> um, because his mom thought, well, hey, if he wants to become president of the United States, we, they got to be born there. <laughs> <laughs> and and I say they because he was actually uh, a twin. So him, his brother, oh, wow. Ivan Arguez, is still alive, um, and he's an incredible poet. Um, he wrote a book after Jose's death uh, in 2011 called uh, – oh, gosh, it has the word – I can't believe it just left me – his um, – Oh my God. I'm going to have to find it out and let you know. Well, we'll, we'll look into that, but yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. I had no idea he had a twin brother named Ivan. That's really, yeah. that's really amazing. And he's still here with us. So really they're yeah. Jose in a way that his, his twin spirit is, is still kind of here, even though he's over there in the other dimension, have an incredible time probably by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, by the way, the name of the book is called a day in the sun. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Highly, highly recommended. But um, yeah, so, you know, that, that, that 1987 harmonic convergence, he, was, he called, you know, the 26 years of the harmonic convergence, because, <clears throat> of course, that led to uh, 2012, the shift of 2012 and 2013, um, where 2013 was known as the launching of the time ship. Um, and 2012 was the, you know, closing of the great cycle of history or the completion of a in the, the Mayan calendar system, the 13 Bakhtun right. cycle. And so he, you know, in his studies of the Mayan mathematics, uh, he came across, um, and, you know, I don't have all the details clear, but there was a, um, a, a particular uh, book he found that pointed to a tradition called the Chilam Balam. And that kind of translates to like Jaguar priests or Jaguar wizards. And it spoke about, um, you know, uh, a cycle, uh, the wizard, the, what was called a wizard's count cycle of time. And um, this is, became kind of the basis of what we at the Foundation for the Law of Time now promote as the 13 moon calendar. And is also kind of was first 
came, say, thrust to the public conscious in the early 90s through um, kind of a game kit called uh, the Dream Spell Journey of Timeship Earth 2013, which introduced the calendar and the 260 galactic signatures in a, uh, in a new form that was uh, based on the same mathematics of the Mayan calendric system, but was intentionally uh, synthesized down in such a form that, say, anyone from any culture could, could learn it. Because he felt like we were not in our normal rhythm. He felt like something was mm -hmm. amiss with the Gregorian calendar, how we use time, how we divide time. It was unnatural to him. W why did he feel that way? Uh, so it was actually in 1989, say, when he discovered the law of time. It's, kind of, it's referred to as like a self-reflective discovery. It was kind of like an aha moment when he and his wife were at a place in um, – Geneva, Switzerland, called the Museum of Time. It, and it's not called the Museum of Time now. It, we tried to find it, but <laughs> at that <t> <laughs> we tried to find it, what it is now. But I guess it was this. It, what it was was a museum full of clocks and you know, kind of the history of the mechanical clock. And he's looking at it. And up until that point, uh, he and his wife uh, Lloyd Dean Arguelles they were they were um, experimenting, like living their lives according to different timing cycles, like that were based from the Mayan calendar where, you know, they have 20 day cycles, 13 day cycles, 260 day cycles, five day cycles. So they were, you know, just practicing on themselves, like uh, experimenting. Oh, well, what if we, you know, organize our life according to this? It's like, what happens? And, you know, when they started doing that, you know, they felt a, a, a profound shift in themselves and their own perception of time. Um, so being then in this so-called museum of time and just seeing it be, a bunch of clocks that's when he realized that uh that here on earth um the human species have actually created an artificial timing frequency um that's kind of say in dissonance with the universal natural timing frequency that literally all of space time and all things above and beyond and deep within the whole universe is synchronized to <laughs> so and we created something outside of that that's like yeah. not in sync with the base rhythm of the entire universe and just everything. It's this yeah. other thing. We, we have a tendency to do that as humans. We create these <laughs> things and put them on top of something. And then we often forget that we created them in the first place. And we think it's natural <laughs> kind of like time yeah. here. So he was experimenting on himself, trying these different methods, but the one he felt was the most beneficial was the 13 moon timing system. Yeah, because, you know, 13 moon, 28 day calendar is um, the site. It's 13 months of 28 days. So you have perfect uh, seven day weeks and every moon is exactly four perfect weeks. So you have an in inherent harmony and regularity and predictability of, of the cycles, um, which actually just has a uh, like a like a cleansing effect on the mind, you know, because, you know, today's Gregorian March or May 7th. So. If, if you can tell me what day of the week June 7th is by the time I finish my paragraph here, you'll, will have, you beat everyone else in the world because <laughs> <laughs> you just can't, you know, it's yeah, just, you, there's no flow to it. Yeah. And our whole society kind of is unconsciously um, it, adherent to this. And it's, it basically is like a collective acceptance of an irrational irregularity, uh, which has, you know, a profound effect, which is evident in just, our, our, our extreme, say, disconnection from nature, our imbalance uh, with nature. <laughs> um, you know, if you, if, if you think about an artificial timing frequency instead of like uh, just the natural frequency, uh, what you have is like our, basically our society is ran by a clock. You know, every other machine that's been invented after the clock basically has a clock in it. And so it's like this clock is just running everything. And then our, our own human biology, it's like, we made it this thing, this machine, and now we're all constantly trying to keep up with it. So it, it's very disruptive. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't seem to lend itself to a harmonious natural existence. Now here's a yeah. question. Was that by design? I mean, was there a point where people that were educated in these things, but yet wanted to maintain power of over other humans put these systems in place in order to take us out of our natural rhythm to kind of keep us in the suppressed state while the people that had that knowledge were able to somehow benefit from that. What are your thoughts? I on mean, that? I mean, it, it, it could be, and there's definitely, um, 
you know, a lot who, who kind of think that and things that may kind of point to that, though it could have also been completely unconscious. Um, though it is kind of interesting to note, like, you know, in the beginning of say when the, when, uh, you know, the circle of 12 was divided up to become kind of the way of dividing our day and dividing our year. Um, this also kind of uh, threw in a calendar that, that made it difficult to, um, say, even track, say, the, the women's menstruation cycle. So you have kind of this, you know, kind of a, appears like a kind of a patriarchal uh, move. <laughs> to, right. Kind of, whereas, whereas prior to that, you know, you have lots of indigenous cultures where their cycles and, and um, time reckoning is is connected with the moon, which uh, is very easily observable and, um, you know, gives them a direct point of reference in terms of what's happening in, in nature. And then you see also how your own bodily cycles um, synchronize or, or syncopate or flow with it. Um, but when you have something that's just kind of arbitrary, you say like, okay, a circle, let's just say it's got 360 degrees. Okay, let's cut it into 12. I mean, um, you know, it's there's a lot of, uh, astronomical reasons why all that was done but like from the point of view of the law of time to to assign uh a flat you know a flat circle and the duration of the movement of little hands spinning around that circle to make that be the definition of time uh actually has like a pro has a like a this really um <laughs> it's a, an effective way of say disconnecting the consciousness that's using it from their own multidimensional nature. Well, that's why I kind of had that thought of it being intentionally there to kind of keep humanity from developing fully. It's just one more obstacle for humans to deal with as they yeah. try to evolve. And it makes you wonder if we did it by accident, was it there you know, as a, as a booby trap or some sort of, like I said, obstacle, I'm not really yeah. sure, but now we have the information. So now yes, we can yeah. actually adjust. Do you personally live by the 13 month, 28 day cycle? Yeah. Yeah. I, I keep track of it every day. <clears throat> well, of course, I mean, living in the world we live in, we have to, we have to continue using clocks and using the, the Gregorian calendar. Um, because that's what everything's based on. Sure. But so it's you like you kind of, both, you, kinda. You, you live with both, you know, and it, it, requ it, it creates a pretty unique perspective, you know, because on the one hand, you're, you're having a, an intimate kind of personal relationship with um, the cycles of natural time where you're, uh, where it's kind of a subjective experience, you know, you're perceiving your own, uh, your own relationship to, to the different cycles and so you develop kind of this relationship of time itself, like, uh, which, you know, is the universal factor of synchronization, um, this rich relationship with that frequency that you're a part of, and then the juxtaposed, uh, you know, oh, it's 560 or 525 on, you know, Tuesday, <laughs> third or whatever. It's just like, <laughs> it's, yeah, you just see, okay, well, this is like the most, uh, um, superficial way we could kind of coordinate our well it's very clinical <laughs> it's very clinical it doesn't <laughs> yeah. leave a lot of room for how it feels emotionally and also spiritually it's very yeah. dry it's very dry and we know that these things have effects on us because if you think about how in america at least i have listeners all over the world but in america we deal with daylight savings time right it, <laughs> Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. I'm yeah. always thrown off by that, whether I gain an hour yeah. or I lose an hour. It's absolutely ridiculous because even though it's this strange kind of calendar, how we sync our time up the Gregorian calendar, it still puts us in a certain type of rhythm. So then when you have something come up like daylight saving times so and you get thrown out of that rhythm, you can feel it. So you're mm -hmm. saying it's even bigger than that because the entire calendar system is broken in a way that's taking us out of these natural cosmic rhythms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, it's really like it, and it does kind of come down to like the history of people who've been in power and, you know, the fact that every human is uh, not infallible <clears throat> and certain, surely all these people who've been in power have not had, you know, uh, <laughs> say perfectly understood the, their own minds and their own biases and their own, uh, kind of trips. So, you know, when you, because the calendar originally was this, um, you know, an even cycle of uh, 
like I think it was like 360 days or, you know, but throughout time it got all jacked up because then Julius Caesar came into power and then he wanted a month named after him. So he wanted it to have more days than the, you know, the the most number of days. So took some days from February or whatever it was called at that time. And then, you know, his successor, Augustus, wanted the same thing. And so just because of these kind of really like, uh, I mean, ego, frankly, e- egotistical, choices, <laughs> everybody's like, like, OK, let's just keep doing that, like forever, unquestioningly. <laughs> OK, but yeah. in 1994, though, Jose did present this 13 moon calendar yeah. to UNESCO mm-hmm. and the United Nations. Tell me yeah. about that. How did that go? So, you know, <clears throat> I mean, if I can back up to lay a little of the groundwork. Uh, sure, go ahead. So today on the 13 moon calendar has a, a and won't go too deep into it just so we don't get all spun out, but <laughs> today's, today's uh, Kin 144. It's the 144th day of a 260 day cycle. It's a day called Yellow Magnetic Seed. And it just so happens that, um, and I didn't plan this. Like I know I said, hey, how about, you know, Gregorian Friday? Cause you know, my full-time job, I don't work Friday. So it works perfect. <laughs> But it just so happens that this kin, this galactic signature, is the same signature that in uh, 1993, please, July 26, 1993, Jose was in Mexico, and um, he woke up uh, with a powerful vision and had a powerful kind of like prof- prophetic transmission that he transcribed, uh, which came to be known as the uh, the Telectonon prophecy of Pakal Votan. And, you know, Pakal Votan was this... Uh, uh, one of the Mayan kings um, whose base was in Palenque, Chiapas, Mexico. Okay. And he and he's the one who had, you've probably seen like the famous, you know, Mayan sarcophagus lid with the guy on there. Yes, where he's like in of, the rocket ship. It looks like he's piloting <laughs> yeah. it, and, but if there's something going up his nose as well. Yeah, there's all kinds of, yeah, you know, it's got yes. the tree coming Very out famous. of the solar plexus. And yeah, it, so th- that's Pakal Votan. And so his, um, you know, his tomb lid and the various, um, you know, uh, uh, hieroglyphics and stuff in, in Palenque, um, communicated all this kind of information, you know, and it turns out within like the vision that Jose had on that day, you know, he felt that this was kind of like a message or something from Puck Alvotan and just saying like, Hey, here's what's going on guys. Like humans are way out of sync with natural time. If they don't get back in sync, there's going to be big problems. <laughs> there's going to be big, like destruction type problems. So, um, so that kind of, you know, that kind of kickstarted um, this whole process of where uh, Jose and his wife began traveling the world, just telling people like, Hey, look, we're in artificial time. And this is why we have a mechanical clock that we invented. We have this irregular 12 month calendar that's irrational and it's not connected to any cycle of nature, but we use it at the, as the basis of organizing ourselves as a collective and this is this is actually putting us in such disharmony with with nature itself that we're, it's it's a path to destruction. So here's the remedy: get your consciousness back tuned in to natural time, so that we can you know feel more integrated with our natural reality, and then therefore make better choices and so on and so forth. So um, you know he presented the calendar also to the UN and and like you said UNESCO. Um, he so he. He, it was kind of his mission at that time. He said, like, look, okay, I was told that this is what's going on, <laughs> you know, or this is what I understand is going on. So it's my responsibility to make sure everyone is aware of it. And after that, hey, it's up to you guys, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so he, he and his wife um, delivered all that information all over the world and, and uh, even took the, took the calendar change kind of idea to the Vatican Church, um, which is because, which is, which is, that's where the Gregorian calendar comes from. Exactly. I was wondering how they took that information. They're like, okay, buddy, sure thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, anecdotally, you know, like what happened is like, you know, they delivered the information and although they never got any response, what they found out is the guy that they gave the information to got promoted. <laughs> so. Nice. They're like, yeah, just put that in the desk there. Just put that in yeah. the third shelf towards the back. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it, and, and, and it's interesting. I mean, really, from some perspective, it's kind of like, what are you talking about? Like, how is this going to make a difference? But that in itself is, you know, kind of shows how we've gotten really disconnected to what time really is, you know, and how well, deeply our, our biology and, and our whole 
it's all based on that rhythm. It's that. Yeah. And like you said, it's the original rhythm, the original paradigm of the universe, the, the creator, yeah. what, whoever designed that rhythm, wherever it came from, that's a natural rhythm. We're out of sync with it. But when you get in sync with it, you're healthier. You can manifest more. You can sense things better. Your intuition's better. Like you said, with uh, the goddesses in our lives, their menstrual cycles are more in sync. They're in sync with each other. There's just so much going on when you get in the natural rhythm of the universe. It makes sense. It's very basic. However, like we talked about earlier, humans, we love to create these artificial things and exist in them and then forget Mm -hmm. that we created them. And somehow it's like, what do you mean the calendar's wrong? And they think that somehow (laughs) the calendar came from you know, on high, like somehow Moses came down with the 10 commandments yeah. and also had <laughs> yeah. this calendar that we're mm-hmm. all supposed to, which didn't happen. Actually, I, you know, Jose's channeled calendar seems far more legitimate. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> if you want something crooked, like, okay, well, here's, here's an option that's not crooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, the biosphere Neosphere transition because this is pretty huge yeah. because we're yeah. in this right now. But I yeah. want I want you yeah. to explain what is the biosphere <laughs> new sphere transition. Well, it's um, so the term noosphere was first introduced um, in 1926, and uh, a guy named Vladimir Vernadsky, who is a Russian biogeochemist, uh, he he wrote a paper called. Um, uh, uh, biosphere and geochemistry, where he talks about this, where the he he perceived that the the various kind of movements and transformations of atoms into different forms on our planet um, is accelerating a, at at a at a high speed because of the influence of humans. Like it's kind of beyond even say carbon emissions or things like that. Like where our our accelerate our the nature of our acceleration is. Um, is is on a whole other level than like the rest of the biosphere and and he referred to this as like the biogenic migration of atoms so it's reaching a kind of climax where then um the matter on earth becomes uh self-reflective which human human matter you could say is self-reflective you know like we can know that we know and question what we know and talk about what we know or think that we know (laughs) sure and and uh um that ultimately like all the, that self-reflective consciousness um, forms a, a, a literal sphere around the earth. Like now that we have spread and populated every populable square inch of the earth, um, literally there is a, a sphere of consciousness around the earth. And that the Noah sphere is, is really all of that as one um, singularly operating kind of, so it's um, our collective consciousness as humans, or does it also include yeah. the Earth's consciousness and the animal's consciousness, or is it just specifically the human consciousness? Yeah, well, it's like human conscious that makes the noosphere conscious. So prior to, mm. yeah, like prior, <laughs> and even, yeah, yeah. so even say like uh, in a book called The Dynamics of Time that Jose uh, wrote, he talks about how... Um, you know, prior to the discovery of the law of time and kind of realizing that humans were disconnected from the cycles of nature, the noosphere was in the unconscious. But as soon as we realized that actually this is one whole unified circuit, including the way we organize organize ourselves in time, you know, it's like time and space are a, are a unified fabric. So uh, um, the way we, once we realize that, the, that we're a part of this, then it's like it's the noosphere becoming conscious. And and really, like it, it's got its roots even deeper than that. Like as Jose Arguez and his apprentice, and now protege, and, and now the president of the Foundation for a Lot of Time, um, Stephanie South, uh, she and him wrote a seven-book series called the Cosmic History Chronicles. That kind of chronicles, I'm sorry, and that shows kind of the more longer-term kind of process of of this uh, of this of this whole transformation that we're going through. Like it goes back basically to the you know the beginning of the universe. You say. 13.7 billion years ago it's like poof it all comes into existence and we go through this whole process matter is you know transforming and then you have the the, the emergence of the human and self-reflective consciousness and the human is kind of like this pivoting door um that that signals the and this is in terms of, uh, of the cosmic history chronicles where the 
involution of spirit then becomes the evolution out of spirit, or, or in other words, evolution has been material and physical up until this point, and then now it's it's returning to source in a spiritual, mental, evolutionary curve. So it's kind of like a, our collective consciousness, but at the same time, it's something that is the evolution of how we exist as humans, whether individually or collectively, we're going to kind of like feed into this noosphere and then it's going to, it's taking on a life of its own and it's going to become us. Like we're going to become that as a natural evolution. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, yeah, the idea it presents is that really like all of, all of human history, including even the disconnection from the natural time and frequency was, was part of this evolutionary um, process of, of getting you know, consciousness to a, po- a place where, okay, now evolution is proceeding in a spiritual mental direction where now the primary, say, um, goal of evolution is, you know, the evolution of our own minds, the uh, evolution of the spirit and the soul. Um, and really, you know, like, I don't know if you heard of Buckminster Fuller, but, you know, he, yes. like he geodesic domes and, and synergy and all that. He, you know, I love, um, something he pointed out is that like we've had you know we've had the technology for like everything to be like all good on earth in the in sense of like everyone has their needs taken care of the basic needs like we've had that ever since his time you know and he, he's been dead for quite a while and so you know if you kind of just imagine how you know once we really kind of get real <laughs> and take care of uh, everybody realize like we all the resources are there like you you can, we can do this. Um, then what's the direction of our civilization? You know, um, you can kind of, when you kind of look at this, so this as this whole process of, of life on earth evolving to this point, it's almost like we've, our minds, it's like we kind of been like children for 5,000 years of history in a way. We're just following oh, this, this impulse of just, you know, empires like spreading around and people getting their territory and, you know, this ongoing kind of fight for survival, like in a general sense, um, is really uh, just kind of this very early stage of of how, you know, say our, I guess you could say our destiny or like potential. Well, we didn't have that planetary consciousness. And is this where planetary consciousness right. comes into play? Because we kind of saw our earth as this endless, vast dimension in early history, <laughs> right? So, you, right, yeah. you, you know, they'd, you'd, you'd hear... Romans talk about how, you know, the, the hordes of the outside lands, you know, it was just mm-hmm. this mystical space. They didn't have the concept of being on a planet, of being together, of being in the very small space that's actually kind of limited compared to the rest of the universe. So is this where the planetary consciousness now is being activated? And is that part of that transition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like it's all, you know, as soon as we, you know, saw the earth, you know, from, from the moon or that image of the earth was transmitted to people's televisions, you know, like we were looking at ourselves, looking at ourselves as I think Jose Arguez put in one of his books and he pointed out that was at that time, like very mind blowing. And now the level of interconnectivity we have is, is, is amazing. And I think what I, you know, some, something I like to think about and just, I wrote about also on my, my newsletter was just the idea of that, we have a collective cognitive dissonance because now more than ever, we were aware of, of what's going on on the earth. I mean, sure, there's a lot that we're not aware of, but what we are aware of is is plenty enough, I think, to create this cognitive dissonance that, you know, kind of creates a certain unease where, you, where everyone's kind of becoming sensitive to the fact that, okay, something's got to change. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> like no the more over way. there. There's no more over there. You know, there's yeah, no more right. distancing yourself from other humans and their experience, whether they're in China or Africa or Europe or wherever humans show up. If they're having a terrible time, that's a problem for everybody. That's a problem for yeah. me. If there's yeah. slaves working in, in sweatshops in China, that's a problem for me. Like there's, because we're all united. And I think like you said, with this instant communication, with this way to connect billions of people so efficiently and perfectly, we're now at the stage where we have to unite. We have to recognize our 
connectedness, our family, the family aspect of humanity. So we can get to that next stage of evolution. And you think about the other species that are out there, potentially extraterrestrial life. Do they have their own version of the newest sphere? That's a good question. <laughs> I certainly don't know. Although, <laughs> <laughs> you know, although, you know, um, I believe, uh, you know, in, in, in Jose's last book, The Manifesto for the Noosphere, which I highly, highly recommend, um, it's published by Random House. Um, it's a relatively small book, but extremely pithy and succinct and mind-blowing. Um, but he refers to, you know, that there are planets with noosphere and planets without noosphere. And so right now we're kind of in the stage of where the noosphere is becoming conscious. And what's really interesting about the noosphere is <clears throat> just by talking about the noosphere i mean if you really th think about it like that is the noosphere you know making it self-conscious where we are right now being the noosphere <laughs> and you see sure you know what kind of comes through when you we, when our own consciousness that is as the human being as the kind of the carrier of self-reflective consciousness here when we start thinking about the noosphere and talking about the noosphere um that is like turning the noosphere on and the noosphere consciousness, you know, like Stephanie South has done some um, really cool, like online group courses and things like that where um, recently where people, you know, are just intentionally trying to create a, uh, a kind of space to allow, you know, a collective higher voice to come through kind of a, a noosphere consciousness to come through. Okay. And, um, the, the results are always incredibly fascinating. Everybody gets uh, really supercharged. You know, if you're, if you're in a group and you want something to talk about, you know, start wondering about the noosphere and what it might want to communicate through you. And, and what is it? And what would life be like if, if it was like that, what would it feel like? And, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get tapped by the noosphere itself. <laughs> well, do you lose individuality within the noosphere at some point, or is there always kind of this individual component in order for us to exist in the third dimension? You know, is there always going to be this separate vehicle with a, you know, an ego and identity in order for yeah. us to exist? Or is the evolution into the noosphere where we're just this group consciousness? Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's it's a little bit of both. I mean, individuality. Everyone, be, everyone will remain absolutely individual and unique, yet at the same time have that tangible, visceral certainty of 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 the total oneness that that we are actually are. Like we can kind of agree to that conceptually, you know. And so it's kind of getting to that point where it's known, you know, like on a gut level, like in your bones. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you could feel it. I mean, we're definitely yeah. evolving. There's some new energy coming in. The world's changing by the moment and not just changing in how we deal with each other or sociologically or economically. It's how we yeah. deal with each other spiritually and how we interact with the third dimension itself. Literally how our mind interacts with matter is changing by the day. It seems to be expanding, which seems to directly feed into what you're talking about with the noosphere. But I'm wondering, does the noosphere, how does that exist with astral dimensions? Like you think about these angelic beings, you know, I've talked to so many guests that interact with angels. Like how would that fit into that world? Like how is it just one more interface point for the human being? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I hadn't, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, certainly, I mean, I've, I've known and, and I've encountered folks who have those kind of experiences too. And like how the whole mechanism works is still, you know, a huge mystery. You know, I think it's, you know, we're getting our baby training wheels here. And then once kind of, you know, once we can get to a point where uh, it's fully consciousness, I, my senses will probably enter a kind of reality that it's a little bit beyond our imagining in the sense that we'll just, have a whole whole different set of of tools and, and values to guide those tools and uh, and you think that's coming we humans are moving towards this reality where we're expanding tell me a little bit more about your thoughts about that where are we going as humans uh yeah i mean it seems like you know right now 
it seems like this it, we're kind of in this place where like the cognitive dissonance is just continually kind of kind of ramping up you know and cranking up you know you have certainly a lot of a lot of channels opening here and there of of, of people who are awakening and, and you know trying their 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 best to do the work to sow the seeds of of a of love you know yeah um, and that's that's always kind of Surely that's always kind of been the case, but now we do have kind of the advantage of interconnectivity, and we can organize ourselves in a in a way that that is is more maybe collectively empowering. But yeah, I mean, it's I think the way it's all going to happen is is kind of going to be a, a mystery. You know, I I certainly don't have the answer. Oh, like, definitely not. But you know, you seem like an yeah. intuitive guy. You've obviously read a lot. I'm sure you've studied quite a bit. I have a feeling you yeah. do have some intuition, but it's probably the same intuition that most spiritual people have right now where it feels kind of uneasy. It feels like the ground's a little shaky. However, there's that beautiful light at the end of the tunnel and you can see it yeah. off in the distance and that light's divinity. It's the creator telling us all that everything is going to be amazing once we make the choice to evolve, because there's so many people that are talking right now about how we're at this timeline split and people are at different mm-hmm. timelines. Some people are staying positive and vibrating up into this new world. Some people are kind of being negative and vibrating into this lower level of existence. Is that something that syncs up with what Jose has talked about, about timeline fractures and timeline splits that are going on right now? Um. <clears throat> I think that's yeah that's a really interesting topic and like for me I, I think it's interesting to consider that like you know all all potentialities are are occurring simultaneously and then for whatever reason right now your consciousness or your you know operating consciousness or your little human puppet <laughs> you know that your <laughs> your your soul is like saying all right here's what you're gonna learn now like this is the thing you have to pay attention to like we're attuned to you know, you're attuned to whatever reality you're attuned to. I'm attuned to whatever. I, and, and you don't even know it. Someone you might run into could be in a completely different kind of reality in, a, in, in like a real way. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it seems like all of, you know, it really comes down like everything just to like individual, individual choice, you know, right. um, and, and kind of say like from the work of the foundation for the law of time, like our focus is like here, here's, here's a tool. Uh, to to, to kind of to liberate from from a an old like kind of disharmonious program to give yourself kind of a a new context a new launching point for your mind to kind of feel free to explore in and kind of self reflect upon yourself and your own existence and uh, kind of get a sense of um, you know where where you're going you know what your soul's say contract is here like what you know what's what's really going on. But in terms of yeah, timeline shifts. I, I like just the other day I, I saw this thing. I think it was just like a meme, you know. It was, <laughs> it was uh, you know that scene from the Matrix where Neo's there and there he's like, you can't scare me with this Gestapo crap or whatever. And so it was the guy saying like, oh yeah, some black holes move, you know. And he's like, oh you can't scare me with this. And the next slide was, oh but they also move in any direction at the speed of light, so we'd never know uh, if it's coming. <laughs> so and to me that really struck interestingly because like in the the cosmic history chronicles um it talks about black holes as being kind of these interdimensional portals like from one reality to another yes i've heard and that. yeah and so like the fact is like at any moment or maybe constantly we're constantly just being blasted through you know any number of black holes just sending us on our path you know like okay, you made this choice, ding, or you, hey, you learned this lesson, ding, you know. <laughs> it's really interesting how the multidimensional multiverse works. I mean, we're hopping timelines, we're bouncing in and out of different realities all the time. I think it's like you said, it's based on a personal choice. It's just like make the right choices, try to do your best, and you're going to yeah. end up exactly where you should. So has anyone, like any country or anyone tried to adopt this 13 moon calendar and, and been successful with it? Uh, I don't think it, any country has officially adopted it. I mean, there is <clears throat> in Brazil, um, there's many cities where um, the last day of the 13 moon calendar, it's called the day out of time, um, simply because there's a 
13 months of 28 days, that's 364 days. The last day of the year is called the Day Out of Time, and it's promoted as a day for peace through culture celebrations, universal forgiveness, you know, celebrating art and the Earth, uh, the planet Earth as a work of art. Um, and then after that, the next day begins, so everyone can kind of begin fresh and inspired. So that day, the Day Out of Time, is an official holiday in a lot of cities in Brazil, um, and that's largely because of all the work of the people down there who learned about this and educated about the calendar. Um, the city of Atlanta, Georgia has that as a, as a municipal holiday. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that they call it exactly the day out of time. You know, they probably kind of had to, the folks there had to, had to work it into their framework, you know, to, so that it could, you know, have, have make sense in, in the context of being a municipal holiday. Sure. I think it, I think it might be something like uh, Peace Through Culture Day or, you know, something like that that's readily understandable. So it made it into the mainstream consciousness. I mean, it's celebrated in places around the world. You know, the legacy lives on. So the information is out there. So that's pretty positive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people, you know, the people who have who have taken it on board in their lives, they, they've gotten so inspired, like a lot of them turn around and then start teaching about it. And then they want to connect with other people who are, who are um, studying it as well. Cause you know, it does create kind of, it, it creates a very uh, tangible change in your, in your experience, you know, from what I've heard from tons of people, just like um, senses of intuition being stronger and also just, um, you'd say even kind of the awakening of like your sixth sense, you know, you're, you're attuned to other things going on beyond just like the physical and that kind of uh, has a liberating kind of effect, you know, lightening things up because you realize you're more than just this dense meat suit. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the foundation's still going. I mean, it was founded by Jose in the year 2000 and it's still going strong. Obviously you're still doing the work there. It's a 501 C three so it is a nonprofit. And mm-hmm. um, what what's the time, some of the work that you do there now? Like, what are you guys doing? Well, right now we're, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, ways of um, just expanding the education, you know, online. Okay. Uh, because that's a really good opportunity for people to connect and, and learn about it together. Um, you know, every year, of course, we produce the 13 Moon Calendar. And we publish, we publish books pretty uh, regularly as well, like, uh, Stephanie South's latest book called um, "The Uninscribed Initiation into the Heart of Time" that that was just released, and that that tells the story of her like introduction to all this and her introduction to uh, Jose Arguez, but even more deeper, kind of like a multi-dimensional, like psychomythic uh, narrative that was unraveling before her very eyes, and kind of and she shares in a really intimate way, like her experience of that um there's not a lot of books out there like that so it kind of really gives a taste of the you know the multi-dimensional aspect of what what this is all you know what this is all about so she's the president and Mm -hmm. she was drawn to this and it activated her in a certain way and now she's receiving information enough to put in these books which are pretty amazing so you guys are doing that work and has there been growth? Are you seeing more people becoming attracted to what you guys are doing and educating themselves? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a a never ending, you know, influx of, of interest and and people learning about it. Um, And especially, you know, really wanting to get education and and learning together in groups about it to kind of activate together. Right. Uh, So that, that's really kind of where, where we're looking now is, you know, how to, you know, how, how to how to put the knowledge out there so people can dive in in a way that um, you know that they're connecting at the same time, right? And they're gaining from the experience. Well, I got to talk to you though about the whole 2012 experience because there was a really big push uh, prior to the Gregorian 2012 date yeah. with uh, yeah. all of this knowledge about Mayan civilization, about Mayan culture, and people were really anticipating something huge happening yeah. around 2012, December 21st, 2012. And a lot of yeah. it was based on Jose Arguez's work and, and other authors as well, Terrence McKenna and other people. Yeah. What was it like for yourself and other members of your organization when 2012 came 
and it was Whoa. nothing really significant happened other than of course like spiritual awakening for some people but there wasn't like an yeah. alien ship landing yeah. or quetzalcoatl didn't come through an interdimensional portal <laughs> like what what yeah. was it like were, were people disappointed in your circles <laughs> well i mean i'm sure there were <laughs> a lot of people disappointed uh, but i mean like uh I know yeah, I, I mean, was, I, I was yeah, hoping like, to, on. I was ready for the ship to show up. I was like, yes, yeah. but hey man, not I'm this ready time. For the intervention at any time. I'm like, hey, <laughs> come on, man. We got, we, we need the cleanup. Yeah, crew. for sure. I mean, I, maybe they're late, you know, they're on a different calendar. <laughs> well, I mean, may, maybe we're just becoming big little boys and girls. We just got to figure it out. <laughs> or what do you think? There's a theory that we did do something. There's one theory yeah. that something did happen, but collectively as humans, we were so yeah. terrified by the thought of change that we instantly re-manifested the exact multiverse that we had before. That's one theory I've heard. And another theory is that the shift did happen. We are yeah. in this new world. We're yeah. just not aware of it yet, but we, it, the shift did happen. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, all that, you know, is, really interesting that you know that jose ended up <clears throat> say leaving the planet in 2011 you know kind of i thought so big, too <clears throat> you know and uh so you know that that kind of set the stage in a in a really uh i mean for us you know personally working with him and everything like that's a is a devastating loss in a way because he was uh, an incredible like amazing like teacher love, yeah I mean, teacher and just like love like love bomb you know yeah like he, for sure he'd, he'd walk in the room and everyone just he could just get everyone laughing and you just you just felt super like supercharged you know <laughs> sure and so um you know leading up to that like we were all in a pretty deep space i i, I think like for me personally i was in a very deep self-reflective space and you know we had, at the foundation for a lot of time ended up kind of organizing a pretty massive um, ceremony in, in Palenque, uh, Mexico. Um, and, uh, yeah, Stephanie South or like, a, one of the Mayan elders named, um, uh, Don Marso, uh, reached out to her and said like, Hey, you know, we let's, you know, let's do, let's do a ceremony together. And so that became, uh, um, that became kind of the, 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 the central focus for us at that time, because a lot of the people say in the 13 calendar change peace movement and so forth, uh, that were all inspired to come. Anyone who could come did come. Obviously people gathered in different areas as well. Like there's oh, a yeah. gathering in, in Cheech and Itza and Egypt. Um, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So it was almost like kind of in a way, maybe kind of like another harmonic convergence in a way that there was a massive synchronization. Yeah. And for me, like my experience of that day is my consciousness was in an extremely mythic and kind of telepathic mode of operation, which, you know, I'm generally pretty skeptical and down to earth. And I, but I love to like, you know, dive in and go deep whenever the opportunity arises. And um, the, just the, the vibration that was created that day, the day of the, you know, December 21st, 2012, and then the following day, it was really like it was really like a, a portal open and like everyone every around me my me personally like everyone around me seemed uh like we were all just like dream characters and we were all operating in this really um kind of synchronized state of 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 unison it was just really uh very very tangible and really hard to describe it was almost like i was still on earth but my consciousness it was like it was earth, but it was this deeper layer of earth. that was kind of this, a mythic, like archetypal root kind of world where, um, you know, everything that was occurring, even the most mundane of things was, was, was taking on this really, uh, powerful, like mythological and symbolic kind of communication. Uh, you know, everything had this deep meaning it was, and I'm sure people have had this kind of state before, and I think, you know, I think that was indicative kind of of the noosphere flickering on and like what the noosphere is going to be like. Cause right. So many people educated themselves about that during that time. And almost yeah. like you're describing, it's almost like it, your world and other people's world during that time took on a 
very psychedelic characteristic and it became yeah. this mind yeah. manifesting experience where we were tapping into something bigger. I, I remember that day yeah. very vividly because I felt those same things. I wasn't in the magical place that you guys were, but I mean, spiritually I was there, you know, and yeah. so many millions of people were it. And that could be like you're saying the newest fear yeah. becoming more online, becoming more activated. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was. I mean, undoubtedly i mean the planetary attention there was a lot of people you know thinking about this moment it was like a real noospheric moment for sure and and i mean just to even disclaim um you know i said we were doing ceremony but there was no you know we weren't it was not there were no substances of any use other than our own it, it was like the noosphere was the psychedelic <laughs> right it was about the ritual the, you know, the experience of connectedness of humans Yes. Yeah. And and not at all that there's anything wrong with that. But I think that's just <laughs> it, interesting to point out that, I mean, you know, there was, we didn't, there was nothing that would have created such a psychedelic effect other than just the profundity of the moment and kind of what was happening. It was, yeah, it was very interesting. And I, you know, I do feel like um, a shift happened in that sense. And I, and I feel like it's, you know, we got seven, eight billion people here and everyone's on a, um, unique spiritual journey and uh, a unique soul's destiny kind of thing. So I feel like probably everybody, um, you know, is just, ex I mean, ultimately everyone's experiencing what they need to experience anyway, but um, surely there's, there's a lot who, who experience some, you know, something tangible on that day. And I feel like what's been coming afterwards has certainly seemed like a ripple type effect. I mean, you know, you got the, the the covid you got all kinds right. of just uh just this kind of the world is in a is in a very weird it's very uh right it's very strange i was talking with ken babs one of the original merry pranksters he's 83 years old he's saying you don't even need to take psychedelics right now because <laughs> the world's psychedelic you see just don't even it's worry about it yeah it's, it's so weird <laughs> well you know it is very strange because it seems like we're in a growth pattern right it needs to stretch it needs to be malleable and shift and change yeah. in a way that's outside of our normal perceptions in order yeah. to get better because yeah, it, uh -huh. you know we have to have that happen humans need to be snapped out of whatever trance they're in in order yeah, to get to this new place that, that's that's well put and it seems like that growth and that stretching is really like it, you know, it's a real kind of stretching. Like there's a resistance there. Like it's, it's like, we're, it's like, we know on, even on, even if it's on an unconscious level that like, we're, we're all changing in some way. And at the same time, like we're trying to hold on really hard to like certain, uh, even like values or points of view or, you know, trying to find some kind of alignment, you know, or like even say, you know, if you try to watch any, any bit of you know news lately it's kind of just like it looks like it's directly out of like uh dr seuss's butter battle book you know <laughs> yeah it's not very uh it's not very happy i'll tell you that much yeah and, it, it, and it's so like it's so cut and dry it's almost like caricature you know that like it's like us versus them and it's it's just really like like is this for real like can like did, did everyone kind of forget about just the all the layers that everyone is experiencing and just kind of being able to agree to disagree and then just work out some finer points. <laughs> well, why, uh, why is those, why are those forces in play? Why, why is yeah. humanity pitted against each other right now? It seems to be a reaction, like you're saying in response to this evolutionary growth, but is it yeah. like a fear-based reaction of our collective consciousness or are there nefarious forces in play that are keeping that, functioning in order to somehow suppress us well you know uh i mean there's that rolling stone song sympathy for the devil <laughs> i kind of <laughs> i always have sympathy for the devil i realize uh uh hey people make bad choices right <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly and like if there is you know say like a devil or something like like say if that the mythology of like this angelic being like kind of saying like nope i'm i'm is more powerful than the creator of the universe i'm gonna go do my own thing and cause all this like 
that's got to cause some karma. I guess you know, like it's going to come back. Yeah, I mean, like, there's definitely if that story did take place in that way, or at least some yeah. mode of that. Yeah, the, the, the person <laughs> created karma for himself. It's a really interesting proposition to be like, yeah, thinking you could yeah. take over, but you know, there's, it's, yeah, there's a ripple. So, like, I kind of in terms of, uh, so on the one hand, I think, yeah, it's an interesting like. I don't know if it's a fear-based response or just a natural response to change. Like, and it, I think it's this cognitive dissonance. Like I think people know more than what, you know, we all know more than what we kind of admit to ourselves. And um, when we go on our day-to-day lives as if things we know are not things that we know are true are not like real realities, you know, we're going to, we're going to have that dissonance. And so when you have that dissonance, it's uneasy when, things feel like they're changing. So it's easy to kind of cling on to things. And, you know, right now you have, you know, you got the, uh, any, any sort of mainstream outlet is just kind of a voice box for a few different people. And, and they don't have perfectly examined minds, you know, maybe they feel their, their, their point of view is virtuous and it is the way, but it's like me, you know, they just happen to be in that, that point where they can actually hit the button that makes everyone hear what they want to be heard. Yeah, people do you know? treat uh, these sources of information like forces of nature where it's coming <laughs> yeah. from somewhere else, not realizing that 99.9% of what we experience on earth is human created, right? Our societies, yeah. our uh, paradigms, our schools, our economy, everything, religion, it's yeah. all human created and mm-hmm. we're just living it. We, we always forget about that which yeah. I think is so interesting, but we don't want to take away our power and say, Oh, it's human created. You know, that means it's terrible. Not necessarily. Yeah. It just means that it's subject to change. It's subject yes. to analysis and also debate. You know, there's yeah. so much <laughs> that we could talk about with humans. I mean, but like we were saying, we're going towards a new place. There's something growing. Yeah. There's something changing that's getting us back into the rhythm of nature, the rhythm of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an incredibly fascinating time. And, you know, I have a seven year old son and a a daughter who's going to soon be three. And I just, I'm just, that boggles my mind to think of what things are going to be like when they're my age or when they're like the age of my parents, you know, it's uh, the, the, the rate of change of things just is, is staggering. Uh, And it's, uh, it's just a fascinating time. And I think that, uh, there's definitely a trajectory going towards it. And I, and I think cert- certainly for me, I guess, having read and, you know, studied this information and exposed myself to it, like makes me I feel a sense of say equanimity towards what's happening. Cause I feel like, okay, there's something bigger going on, like behind everything. And, um, and what's important for me is to keep my own, uh, peace of mind and ensure that my own relationship act are, are impacted in a good way by my choices, you know, and just kind of, it, it kind of really does help to simplify, simplify things. Well, you, it gets real, it gets easy to get real swept up in all the, all the, the drama. The, oh the my drama. God. Yeah. I know. Well, the only <laughs> part of the universe that you have complete control over is yourself. It's been said by so many people, including Aldous Huxley. And you think about your kids you may have control of them for a little bit until they're 18 and then they're off doing their own thing. So really you only have control over yourself. That's why you have to develop yourself. You have to get better and do better, get in sync potentially with this 13 moon, 28 day cycle. You know, that could be a step for you. If people want to know more about this, they want to know more about the foundation for the law of time. Where do they go? Um, yeah, just go to lawoftime.org, um, and there you can, there's a lot of free downloads there. I think like on the main menu, it says like what we do, and there's a place where you can get some free, like introductory materials. It's all, there's a lot of free downloads there to get you all introduced. Well, I noticed the calendar is there. The 13 month, 28 day calendar is there for free. Yeah. Yeah. Every year we put a downloadable free one out there so that you can have at least a reference where you can see what the galactic signature of the day is, what moon we're in and so forth. Right. And you also have and, a, a newest letter, not a newsletter yeah, yeah, <laughs> that you can sign letter. up for. Uh-huh. And there's yeah. also great books. I mean, all of Jose's books are there for purchase, yeah. you know, and if you want to support 
the foundation, there's a donation section, which I think is really interesting because you probably do get a lot of support still all over the world. People that read Jose's books and they feel inspired and they, and they want to help you guys out. I mean, that, that is still coming in, right? Yeah. I mean, we're only able to continue because people continue to support either through donations or are purchasing the materials. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. That's really uh, amazing. Thank you people out there that are doing that. That's so generous of you. Yeah, absolutely. They have my profound thanks. It's a real, real privilege even to be able to, to, to work at the foundation and, and be able to, you know, get in touch with everyone who comes in and is on a, on a path of, you know, some kind of magical path where they're figuring out. Well, the cool thing is it's a nonprofit, right? So like, you you know, they get a donation and it's a tax deduction. So, you know, not only are you helping, you're also, you know, taking things down. So maybe you don't have to give so much to the, uh, the government or just actually using that money to make weapons of destruction a lot of the time. (laughs) Well, you know, I noticed one thing that's cool on your website is that you can get your personal galactic signature like you can input yeah. your birthday and then it determines mm-hmm. what galactic signature you have i did mine and i'm oh, good. okay i'm a red rhythmic dragon are you kidding no you're not yes because that, that was yours as well signature. i know that's <laughs> i did see that online we both have the same initials what? we're both named jacob i'm jacob weaver <laughs> he's jacob wyatt and we're both Red rhythmic dragons. Well, what does that mean? Tell me more about that. You you know, wow. since you're one, what does that mean? Well, I mean, just to put that in perspective, the odds of that are <laughs> insane. You know, <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's a that's a meeting, a destined meeting. Yes, for sure. of course. <laughs> I mean, we've had such a great conversation. Every, I mean, I, I I'm looking at the clock. I can't even believe this much time's gone by because it just feels like we've been talking for like five minutes. You're an incredible human being. I love talking to you, but tell me more about the Red Rhythmic Dragon. I will, yeah. So it's one of 260 galactic signatures. And oh, that's so every all. day, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So every day has a galactic signature. So you look up your birth date and you have a signature, and that's kind of your, uh, it, it's kind of your higher dimensional self or like your mythic self. The idea is you, you get the chance to identify with. And it's all, you know, have an experimenter's mindset about it. Just, okay, what if I, you know, I start identifying myself as a red rhythmic dragon, you know, see what, sure. see what kind of frees up, you know, because, you know, it's t- kind of taking your consciousness out of the, the conditional identity, you know, based on your history or place of birth or whatever. And this um, definition is based on Jose's writings. Is that right? Yeah, so the I mean, so the galactic signature is a combination of so the red dragon is one of twenty solar seals, and the rhythmic tone is one of thirteen galactic tones. So thirteen and twenty, thirteen times twenty is two sixty. So the uh, all the permutations of those make up all the two hundred sixty galactic signatures, and um, the thirteen the ratio thirteen twenty is literally the frequency of the natural timing frequency we talked about before. Um, and so Red Rhythmic Dragon says, um, and, and every signature has its own code spell. So each sig- each seal and each tone has uh, three key words. And there's only three key words intentionally because it's higher dimensional information that's trying to communicate through English words or whatever language you're speaking through those words. And the more words we say, it's kind of, the more words said about it kind of makes it harder for your own, say, multidimensional self to to digest what it is. I mean, the idea is you meditate on the code words. So interesting. The drag, yeah. So the dragon has the keywords of nurtures, birth, and being. And then the rhythmic tone has the keywords of organize, balance, and equality. And so those code words kind of together make the 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 full code spell for the rhythmic dragon, which says, um, I organize in order to nurture, balancing being. I seal the input of birth with the rhythmic tone of equality. I am guided by my own power doubled. So, <laughs> ah, well, this yeah, is our so own you, power doubled, me and you together. You got it, dude. <laughs> Jacobs of the U World Unite. I want to talk to you about one more thing before we go, because this is something that I see come up that I think is really interesting. And it's this concept that you brought up at the beginning of the 144,000. Now, this concept... Okay comes up in uh, Christianity 
in the book of Revelations, they talk about the elect yeah. of God, the 144,000. You're saying it showed up in uh, Mayan prophecy with the 144,000 solar shields. Is that correct? Uh, 144,000 sun dancers. Sun dancers. That's what it is. And yeah. then, you know, you think about the great pyramid in Egypt. It has 144,000 blocks. There's all. And then in uh, the Mayan calendar, I believe uh, the number 144,000 shows up as well. So what does yeah. this mean? It, what is this symbol? What is the frequency of the 144,000? Because there's the religious connotations. There's these cultural connotations. Like, what does that mean for you? Well, <clears throat> It's yeah, it's, it's well, it's twelve times twelve, of course. Um, so it's a it's a it's a square number, and you know, one forty four, like you say, it has all of these connotations. It, it's there's even the hundred forty four thousand, uh, you know, um, spiritual fibers that go up, up and down the you know the central column, like the the Shushumna, the hundred forty four thousand nadis, I think it's called. Is that Kabbalah or what is that? That's that's like with the chakra system. Oh, okay. Hindu. You know the the apana, yeah the uh, the yeah the the the, the circuit that's where, where your central columns the shashumna. And, so know, it's showing up all over these different cultures all over the world. Yeah, yeah, and it's and what's really interesting is you know one of uh, Jose's final say revelations and the main thing he was focusing on before he uh, before he right up until he passed away was <clears throat> uh, a matrix of four hundred forty one. Um, he had a dream where he had a telepathic message that said 441 is your telepathic frequency index. And he's like, what the heck is that? And he spent, you know, he just obsessed, you know, he felt like he was like going mad, like a mad scientist obsessing over this uh, matrix of 21 times 21, which equals 441. So it's very interesting that 12 times 12 is 144. And you just reverse the whole thing. Twenty-one times twenty-one is four four one, and it and it became the the this matrix known as the Holomine Perceiver and um, a system of telepathic communication called the Synchronotron, and that's kind of like the ultimate or most ad, more advanced study of the law of time, where um, there's m several matrices of four hundred forty-one with different uh, number configurations. And that also have uh, particular kinds of multidimensional circuits coded into them, and every day you track you track the movement on these matrices, and you you come to you know your own telepathic frequency index or the telepathic frequency index for the day, and so it kind of it goes to a deeper root of this whole frequency of time because what's happening is you you're ending up communicating through the dimension of number which of course transcends and precedes language as far as communication and which uh, the law of time describes as kind of the, the language of telepathy is through number. So if, if you like number and you want to <laughs> learn about that, check out the synchronotron at, at lawoftime.org and that'll give you something that'll make, Keep Give you busy. something to chew on for a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Jacob, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, I we didn't even get into synchronicity. We could talk oh. about deja vu. Oh there's so much <laughs> wow. that we could talk about, but I don't want to yeah. take up too much of your time. We're creeping on the hour and 15 mark, but I do want to thank you for being on the show. We'll have you back on. We'll talk about this again when the time is right, I guess, right? <laughs> that, that sounds great, Jake. I'd, I'd be happy to dive in with you on on any topic. If we we could spin the wheel and whatever topic you want to drill in on, we can we can do it. <laughs> and I want to tell everybody one more time: you can go to the website lawoftime.org, and of course, newtimecourse.com. Those are places where you can learn more about the foundation. They have the calendar there. You can sign up for the newest letter. There's books. You can donate. There's so much going on. I want everybody to go there and check it out, lawoftime.org. Jacob, thank you so much for being on the show. Hold on the line through the outro music. And everybody, we'll see you next week, Midnight on Earth.